Hello everybody, Scott Golden here from Wrestling Logic, and uh, we're going to do the Money in the Bank 2020 review here momentarily. Uh, if you're new here, please like, subscribe, comment below. Uh, just a real short overview before we get started in the details. I'm either getting too old for this, or mainstream wrestling is starting to pass me by. Um... This, to me, was a completely skippable show. Uh, actually, I, I want to correct that. Completely skippable event. I don't like the word show. I was taught better than that. Anyway, um, nothing on here streams has to be seen. Nothing on here does anything to advance stories, to make people want to see things tomorrow. Nothing on here is indicative of hey we're in the middle of a pandemic let's give people something they can't forget and yet i can't fault the talent for any of it because they did the best they could with what they had um it's just we're at a place uh maybe in society too where people will settle for less and and consider it acceptable and that's the only reason that I can imagine people thinking of this as a decent uh, event. Um, I, I'm just, I'm, I'm sad. I'm gobsmacked. I'm sad. I'm just lost because in a lot of ways, there's nothing wrong with the work of the event. But if somebody were to say, you know, did I miss anything? I can't. Outside of the spectacle of the ladder match concept, which I guess theatrically might have been fun, but from a wrestling standpoint, was absolutely nothing of value. Um, you know, one of the best matches on the show was the uh, pre-show match, Jeff Hardy and Cesaro, because that's because Cesaro works well, but really, from comedy spots that didn't belong to lackluster semi-main event matches to the the latter thing this is probably the most skippable wwe has been for me in oh at least four or five years and probably as far as big shows are concerned up there with december to dismember uh 2000 what was it six seven whatever that was the the show they they cut really short and um, I don't know. So anyway, we open with a pre-show match. Jeff Hardy and Cesaro, as mentioned. Um, they start slow, really basic. Uh, you know, they, I, I mean, it is kind of weird to put Jeff Hardy after you give him four weeks, five weeks of TV time. You put him on the pre-show of a of a throwaway network event. I refuse to call them pay-per-views anymore because, well, that's not what they are. Um, maybe there's still pay-per-view somewhere in the country, but for most people, they're network events. Um, you know, the fact that Jeff doesn't even get main show just doesn't make sense after you put all that TV time into him, but it's, it's a downtime on TV as far as Fox is concerned, so maybe that doesn't matter either. Uh... Cesaro has an early advantage, basic wrestling, and then a power slam uh, by Hardy, uh, and then we use the skilled steps, but uh, uh, Cesaro catches him and nails him on the barricade on the outside. Cesaro in control and hits an elbow drop off the second rope. Uh, pace is slowed down at this point. Hardy fights back, and they go back to the floor. Cesaro recovers and is kind of manhandling Hardy around, including apron shots and the floor. Uh, leg drop off the second rope in the ring for near fall. Cesaro applies an abdominal stretch, but Hardy counters it with a basic hip toss. Proof that, you know, basic wrestling still matters here, folks. Uh, Cesaro regained control. But um, Hardy hits a jawbreaker. Hardy then picks up the pace and gets another near fall. Climbs to the top, but 
uh, Cesaro cuts him off. They fight on the top rope and whisper in the wind uh, and just uh, kind of a botch spot as Hardy lands on Cesaro's knee. Hope Cesaro's okay after that. Cesaro comes back with a series of uppercuts. Hardy hits a twist of fate for a, another near fall. There's good back and forth here. Hardy climbs to the top rope, but Cesaro cuts him off again with an uppercut and then hits a gut wrench suplex off the top. Beautiful move, by the way. Uh, back outside. I, I, I hate all this outside the ring stuff, but it's smoke and mirrors because there's no fans. I get it. Um, Hardy whips Cesaro's knee into the steel steps. Hardy then follows up with a crossbody off the barricade, and Hardy hits a swanton for the win. Kind of lackluster, but at the same time, a good way to kick things off, I suppose. Then we go to the main show with the four-way tag match uh, for the tag team championships. New Day uh, is victorious, which I guess is the only thing you could do in this situation. It does beg the question, how come the SmackDown tag team champions are on the event, but the Raw uh, champions aren't? Um, If you're going to give to one, give to the other, but maybe there's a reason. But anyhow... Uh, single elimination or single pinfall rules apply here. Lucha House Party, Miz and Morrison, and the Forgotten Sons with Jackson Riker, uh, provide the opposition. Uh, a lot of people that, you know, on, on social media were saying this is a good match. This is not my idea of a good match. This is my idea of spot, 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 um... And really isn't memorable. Like if you, if you a month from today, ask what the opener was to the pay per view, I would say maybe ten percent of people would know. Um, I the nice action, I guess. Kofi and Grand Metalik start the match, and there's quick back and forth action there. Uh, Kingston fights off from Rana's and other flips. Cutler makes a blind tag. Uh, Metal Metal League hits a double springboard back elbow. And the Forgotten Sons are taken out in the process. Uh, Metal League attempts to dive, but Morrison cuts him off. And uh, Morrison, or uh, one of them hits a... Metal League hits a Spanish fly on Morrison off the top of the floor. Under the other participants. And I'm sitting here and I'm going, okay... So this is a throwaway show on an off month after the biggest show of the year. And we do a spot where everybody goes to the floor with a Spanish fly. Why? I, I love the athleticism. Don't, don't get me wrong. I love the, the, the guys who are willing to risk their bodies. I respect them. But why? With no audience... A spot that should be like, wow, and we can put that in a highlight reel, and we can use it to open the SmackDown opener, and yay, is just thrown away. <laughs> and it's like, I remember when Jake Roberts could get mileage out of a DDT. Now, WWE can't get mileage out of a Winnebago. It's just, it's, it's sad. Um, anyway, so... Forgotten Sons take over, and they cut off the ring on Metalik. Dorado runs in, hits a standing dropkick on The Miz, and then standing moonsault on Morrison for a near fall. Uh, New Day hits a doomsday device for a near fall. Like I said, just spots all over the place, and it's non-sequential. Um... Miz tags in and hits a skull-crushing finale for a very close near fall. Actually, Miz hooked me here. I actually thought Miz and Morrison was going to win, which would have made me at least moderately happy because it would have kind of been like, hey, a surprise, but not to be. Uh, so then all four teams start brawling all over the place. Dorado hits Spinebuster uh, for a near fall on Morrison. Dorado... Up with a splash, Biggie and Middle League hits an elbow for a close fall. Forgotten Sons make the save. Biggie launches Kingston over the top rope and onto the Forgotten Sons. Uh, Riker interferes. Referee throws him out. Uh, Dorado and Middle League hit springboard cross body blocks off onto the floor. 
Metal Link hits a springboard crossbody into the ring, but Big E catches him. Kingston then hits uh, Trouble in Paradise on Lindsay Dorado. Big E hits a big ending on Metal Link for the win. Again, athletically, great. If you like matches that are just athletics and you like some, one of the teams or more than one of the teams involved in the match, give this a watch. There's nothing technically wrong with it. But if you're if you're a story person or you're a matches make psychological sense person or you're a every match should have a place on the card person, this will do nothing for you. Uh, Lacey, uh, Lacey Evans promises uh, to win and cash in on Bailey. I don't get Lacey Evans like. One week she's this prissy Southern Belle. Another week she's an army brat who's tough. Another week she's a fighter who's going to knock you out. Who and what is she? Could she stick with something? Or maybe the deal is Lacey Evans has like MPD and she changes characters all the time. Anyway, Charlie Caruso interviews Drew in the back. McIntyre worked his whole life for this, and he's not going to give the title away tonight. Uh, SmackDown announced team of Michael Cole and Corey Graves. I, okay, I've never been a Michael Cole fan, but tonight just, and it's not specific things. I mean, I, I could have kept notes, and maybe it's because I did commentary for, for a dozen years. Maybe I'm just super sensitive about what I like and what I don't like, but Gosh, never more than tonight did did Cole, did Cole feel like a corporate shill who was just trying to shove down our throats the stuff we were being fed as caviar when in reality it's like, you know, spam in a can. Um, anyway, so uh, we move on to R-Truth versus MVP, which, all right. Time filler on a show that doesn't even go three full hours. Yay! Not. Um, so, Truth comes out, and he's doing his singing and dancing deal. He acted like there's fans in the building. So either R-Truth eats lead paint, or R-Truth doesn't take the pandemic seriously, or R-Truth's stupid, or he's told to do something stupid, or people just thought this would be funny. Either way, anyway, it's stupid he actually tells an invisible group of people to make noise um so mvp comes out now mvp i think i thought he was supposed to be like an agent and then he was supposed to be like a manager or an, or a, an advocate and then <laughs> he's out there gonna wrestle uh so they do this little bit where uh, truth of trying to teach MVP about balling like basketball, not balling like being rich. So, you know, there's the basketball humor. This is a two pointer, this is a three pointer, and I'm sitting here going, and this has no point. Um, anyway, so for some reason, Bobby Lashley's music hit, and he makes his way to the ring. Lashley wants to, wants to fight Truth. And the MVP says, I'm glad, I'll gladly duck out. Truth says he wants to duck out, too. Uh, so, Lashley is not going for that. Anyway, there's no acknowledgement of Lana, so she's not in the building, or she's off getting her hair done, or she's wherever. I mean, they acknowledge her in commentary, but they don't acknowledge why she's not present. Um, Lashley dominates. Um, you know, Lashley... Hits a standing vertical suplex, and Truth slips behind him, um, and then hits a spear. It's a, it's a dead match, cr crampy comedy. Lashley gets a victory over a sea level strain guy. Um, so Caleb Braxton interviews Bailey and Sasha in the back. And uh, Braxton wondered if Bailey blamed Sasha for her loss on Friday on SmackDown, trying to start trouble. Bailey cuts her off and says there's no problem between them. 
Bailey walks off, but Banks T is speaking, and then she follows behind, so they're still teasing a breakup for the 878th time. So then we go to the women's match, Bailey with Sasha versus Tamina. Um, now, full disclosure, I've never been a Tamina fan. Uh, I don't, other than the fact she's related to Hall of Famer Jimmy Snuka, I don't get what anybody sees in her. So if you see something that I don't see, please comment below because I just don't get it. Um, I, I mean, if, if you want to say she's got a job because of who her, her dad is, okay. But even then... You're telling me that she keeps a job where other women, I'm sure, even at the NXT level or lower, were let go during this whole pandemic layoff thing. No, just no. Um, anyway, basic match. Uh, it's got maybe the last quarter of it was was considered good. The rest is kind of passable. Bailey's great. I have always loved Bailey, although. I will admit, I like the dorky, slow, baby face Bailey better than this. But at the same time, I still like her. I still think they could have done more with the transition into her being a heel. But, oh well, time passed by. Um, anyway, Tamina takes over and Bailey uses holds like a sleeper. And then they use the ring and the buckle. Um... Tamina hits a splash in the corner. Tamina tries to super kick Bailey, goes after the knee. Bailey does a good bit of work on the knee throughout the match. Tamina fights, breaks the hold. Bailey attempts a Samoan drop. Now, I think the idea of this was the satire of Bailey, who's like, uh, I don't know, and I I'm not fat shaming here, but I'm guessing at least 75 pounds. Lighter than Tamina, um, you know, kind of trying to do that hold and just caving under the weight. But it really, made, if if this was real, why the heck would you try and lift her? You know, like duh. Um, but obviously, it's a it's a babyface comeback spot. Anyhow, um, Tamina, um, you know, is still off balance for quite a bit. Um, they go to the outside, Bailey is thirsty, she takes water, she takes a swig, and then throws the rest of the water in the face of, um, in the face of uh, Tamina. Um, he, here's one of the places where Cole just, you know, he's like, ah, get back in the ring, Bailey, and it's like, yo, dude, why are you... So passionate about what Bailey does, but then in other matches you don't care at all what other heels do. It just there's no consistency in his delivery. He'll he'll be cutting with one line and then completely patronizing the next. And if Michael Cole would just find a voice and stick with it and not be produced to all heck, maybe I could give him a pass. But he just, none of his words sound like they're his own. It's the best way I can describe it. And it's it's grating to watch. So, Tamina snaps. And then she regains control. Uh, Tamina catches Bailey with a super kick. And then Tamina uh, throws Bailey over the announce table on the outside. And then Tamina uh, attempts a splash, but Bailey gets her feet up. Tamina catches her leg and then lifts her and then uh, hits a super kick and tries to slow and drop. Banks distracts Tamina and uh, let the hold. Tamina lets the hold go that she has on. Tamina chases Banks around the ring. Bailey. Uh, reverses into a cru into a crucifix when Tamina tries to use the um, the Samoan drop a second or third time gets the win okay so Bailey who I think is prob 
probably the best woman on SmackDown, and maybe at least the top three in the company. I'd say Charlotte is overall better, and I would say the Becky Lynch is overall better. Um, Asuka, I I know everybody loves Asuka. I think she's still hampered by not speaking English, although she's got charisma that every girl in the company could benefit from. Um, so maybe Bailey's top four. But anyway, why do you hate on Bailey so much giving her a match like this? I just, I, I don't know. Anyway, so Seth Rollins discussed his championship match against Drew Later, promised to win, and then we move on to the Universal Championship match. Braun Strowman, Bray Wyatt retains. Um... So, Strowman comes out, has the early advantage, uses his power. Uh, the psychotic laugh of Bray Wyatt and Bray Wyatt's facials are just money gold. Um, I, I don't know if he took method acting classes or what the deal is, but man, enjoyable, enjoyable. Uh, Wyatt takes over, but Strowman comes back with power again. Strowman tosses Wyatt around in, and then tosses him into the ring post on the floor. Um, Strowman runs to ringside and Strowman hits over the announce table. The puppets are there. Um, I don't quite understand who's operating the puppets or why the puppets get to be in the building, but like we couldn't use stagehands to give the illusion of a crowd, but maybe I'm just slow. Anyway... So, uh, Wyatt hits a Tornado DDT at a point, and then Wyatt also had hit another DDT on the floor in a clothesline for a near fall. Um, Wyatt goes for Sister Abigail a second time, but Strowman counters with a choke slam. Good choke slam, by the way. Uh, Strowman hits a splash in the corner. And he runs around, knocks Wyatt down and all that stuff. Wyatt recovers and knocks Strowman off the apron. Uh, Strowman stands up and he's wearing the black sheep mask. There's a teaser spot where um, this thrills Bray Wyatt. He thinks he's got in his head. He thinks he's, you know, I've got this. And he's, I told him, I told him, and he's all over the place. Puppets are overjoyed with the fact. Now, I wish somebody could bring back. Remember Hen Henrietta Pussycat, the Mr. Rogers puppet? If they could bring back a cat that meows, that would be phenomenal for, for Bray. You know, like a like a, a puppet hybrid. I don't know. I just think that'd be fun. Um, anyway, so Bray goes back. Or, um, Strowman goes back in. And he, he does the, the crucifix pose, and then they hug. And I'm waiting, because when I see the hug, the first thing I'm thinking is, and now Strowman hits a belly-to-belly -belly suplex, betrays Bray with the mask on, then rips the mask off and destroys it. But that's not what happens. Uh, instead, Strowman pulls uh, uh, Wyatt into him and then stomps on the mask. Hits a power slam and then uh, gets the win. After the match, we see Visions of the Fiend. So obviously the, uh, you know, obviously the feud will continue. Then we go into the championship match, which just with Drew and, and Seth, and it just it falls flat, man. Like I. Technically, it was fine, although there's a couple things that I saw that I'm sitting there cringing at. But nothing horrible to where the match isn't worth watching. Uh, but, I mean, there's people that are calling this good. And I, one of my pet peeves is there's a point where Rollins hits like three uh, knee strikes. And they're all elevated from the floor or they're, they're you know, like a running style. And Drew gets back up and he's not selling them for more than 15 to 30 seconds in an age of M mma a knee strike should mean something at least a 30 second sell and the fact that it doesn't just 
A makes the champion look superhuman. B makes the guy executing the move look like a dunce. And it's just, it's yuck. No. Strikes should mean something. Um, so anyway, uh, McIntyre has the early advantage. Uh, Rollins attacks the knee. We've seen knee attacks throughout the night, so maybe a different body part would have been good. Uh, Rollins hits a sling blade at one point for a near fall. Rollins applies a single leg crab, transitions into an STF. Good use on, if, if you're going to go with the knee, they, I mean, they're telling a good story with it. Rollins moves into a cross face. McIntyre makes it to the rope to break the fall. Um, a second suicide dive from Rollins. And then we start to see the knees off the apron, which look good, but should have more impact than they do. Um, and then Rollins goes for a third dive, but is caught this time and launched over the announce table. Um, McIntyre rolls him back in, hits a big boot, and comes off the top rope. McIntyre went for the Claymore kick, but Rollins bails out. Um, uh, McIntyre comes back with a spine buster in a near fall. McIntyre goes for the DDT, but Rollins fights free. Rollins attempts to pin, but only gets a, gets a one count. Rollins then hits a frog splash that is again undersold. Rollins attempts the curve stomp for the second or third time in the match, but McIntyre hits a future shock DDT for a near fall. Uh, McIntyre and Rollins fight on the top turnbuckle. McIntyre tosses Rollins across the ring, and uh, there's a super kick as an answer to the Claymore kick. I I hate that so many people are using super kicks in WWE, especially when that's you know the Bucks over an AEW thing. There should be a moratorium against the move, but that's just me. Um, finish comes when. Uh, McIntyre hits his Glasgow kiss, and, um, then he hits, uh, then Rollins hits another super kick, it's like third or fourth of the match, McIntyre bounces off the ropes and hits a Claymore kick for the win to retain the title, the win comes out of nowhere, you need your champion to look strong, the fact that they're not willing to let Seth, which by the way, I've, I've seen on, on social media, and I've heard one of the one of the C-level announcers was talking tonight, Seth Rollins, one of the best of all time. What? R really? I mean, he's good, but in another era, he wouldn't have gotten above the mid-card. Like, he's good for today's standard, but if you put Seth Rollins in, say, 1995, he would have been Intercontinental Champion at best. Um... So, it just shows me how much standards have fallen. Now, if you said Dean Ambrose, he's got character development. He's a guy that's that's good. He, Roman Reigns was, was the darling of Vince for so long, so I don't even count him in, in, in terms of that. But, really, to call Rollins one of the best of all time, maybe one of the best of the last 10 years, I could buy that. But all time? No. Just no way. It's hype, and it makes everyone seem... It seemed ridiculous. So, then we go to the six uh, men, six women, so 12 people, uh, Money in the Bank, th theatrical stuff. Um, there's background music, and there's cut scenes, and there's awkward facials, and lots of weapons, and... <laughs> so... Um, some people are going to love this. Some people are going to hate this. I'm in the traditionalist. I hate this camp. Um, it took too long and it was shorter than I expected. I think they ran like 20 some, maybe 30 minutes, but in total, the cutscenes made it, uh, made it difficult. So women are in front of the elevators. Men met in the headquarters gym um, each person comes out to their entrance music in an office building. What? Why? Anyway, um, 
Asuka uh, doesn't show up. She's on a balcony somewhere in the building. She leaps off the balcony and wipes out every woman standing below her. That's kind of cool. She jumps up and down. She goes to the elevator. Asuka is the smartest of the 12 people involved in the match. Within the first two minutes, she's interested in winning. Anyway, um, you know, she's in the elevator and she's dancing because she thinks she's ahead of everybody. Now, why the elevator doesn't go to the top floor and Asuka wins immediately, one will never know. But anyhow, men fight in the gym. Corbin tries to hit uh, Brian with with a plate, but then Brian moves and, and Corbin destroys a mirror. There's a moment where Baron Corbin looks like, oh, crap, I just broke a mirror. What bad luck am I going to have? Well, the bad luck is is for the fans, not for you. They, unfortunately, have to watch you. Um, Anyway, Otis uh, places a heavy barbell on Styles' chest. I hated this spot. Two reasons. Number one, AJ looks weak because he can't lift the barbell off because it's not like there's 700 pounds on it. Number two, if there's kids out there who mimic this stuff and somebody ever gets like a barbell across the chest in middle school and the kid's slow or something, and since since Ray refuses to come help AJ because AJ's begging for help and Ray's nearby, it just I can only imagine a kid... Uh, you know, leaving their friend with a barbell across their chest and the kid, like, suffocating or something dangerous. I just, it was a needless spot. Anyhow, so, men and women run away. Mysterio bumps into Brother Love in the bathroom. Yes, Brother Love, Bruce Pritchard, in the bathroom. Now, if you're going to do the Brother Love spot, this is just me, but I would have used it to get somebody over and have a, what would have amounted to the the video equivalent of a video bite. Rather than have it be Ray, why not have it be Aleister Black? Aleister Black's ticked off at, at Money in the Bank being treated like a gimmick, so he hauls off and hits a round kick on Brother Love, Brother Love goes down, and then you have this footage of Aleister Black, a new talent, taking out an old talent. That's what I would have done with that spot if it were me, but anyhow. Um, so, man fight in the hallway... Uh, Daniel Bryan, Otis, and Black, and Corbin all run in the same to the same elevator. Again, they continue to fight. Women chase each other up the stairs. Um, you know, everybody brawls around, and Bryan rocks Corbin with yes kicks. Uh, so we see Doink the Clown hiding behind a chair. Although it's not the original joint mask, so it's kind of sad. Um, nobody hits Doink, which is also sad. Somebody could have hit Doink with something, and again, I had a comedy spot that would have added something and made it memorable. Anyway, so Nia Jax, and Baszler, and Brooke, and Carmella, they're fighting in the conference room. Uh, Brooks wipes out Jack with a, Jack's with a steel chair, and she notices a briefcase. She's briefcase. She's about to cry because she grabs the briefcase, and then we see a cameo from Stephanie McMahon and told her that this was just a this was like the marketing room. The real briefcase was on the roof, and Dane is made to look like an idiot for not paying attention to the rules for the last several weeks that have been explained, explained, explained. Uh, so Carmella Moon walks out of the room. Evans gets to knock her out. Styles searches for Mysterio in the hallway. He sees a picture of the Undertaker and turns white as a ghost. Um, then we see Black showing up and kick Styles. And Black locks the door and runs off. Paul Heyman is sitting in front of a table with more food than a, a small village could eat. Uh, he's smirking and happy. Um, then we see the men and women run into the room. Otis yells, food fight. They all start throwing food. Heyman gets nailed with some food in the face. His facial is great. Uh, Baszler locks in uh, a clutch and then Jackson Otis uh, sandwich Mysterio 
Otis and Jax is the last one standing in the room. They kind of go face to face with each other. And John Laurinaitis shows up and Otis throws a pie in his face. Uh, <clears throat> women battle under the roof. Um, Black and Brian fight into the hallway. Styles shows up. Styles and and Brian fight into Vince's office. Vince says, out. They then, uh, they then adjust the chairs and apologize. And, uh, comedy. So then, um, Styles and Brian um, chastise each other over being weak in front of Vince. And then Styles hits a really stiff forearm, or looks stiff anyway. Um, Asuka and Jax were the first ones to the roof. And they get into a ring, which has mysteriously appeared on the roof. I wouldn't have suspected there to be one there, but there was. Um, Asuka... Cuts off her opponent. Evans tries climbing up the ladder, but she's pulled down. Evans and Oscar fight on the top of the ladder. Oscar knocks her off, and Evans, or yeah, Evans lands on Jax. Then we see Oscar climb to the top, but Corbin runs up the same ladder. He tries to grab the men's briefcase, cutting Oscar off temporarily, but Oscar kicks him off, and Oscar pulls down the woman's briefcase now that's man on woman violence with the woman coming out ahead it means one of two things nobody thought that through when they scripted it or maybe we could have intergender intergender matches in certain scenarios personally i'm i'm pro intergender match as long as the storyline is said that women want equality and they don't care about fighting a man and if that's done i have no problem with the whole Inner, you know, intergender match concept. Some people do. If that offends you, I apologize for my stance, but I think they could do something with men versus women uh, that would spice the program up a bit. Anyway, uh, match turns into a basic match at this point. Um, Styles knocks over the ladder with Black and Mysterio on top. Corbin grabs Mysterio and tosses him over the side of the building. Corbin then threw Black off the side of the building as well. This is just hokey. Uh, Styles hits a forearm on Otis. Styles and Corbin fought to the top of the ladder. They both get their hands on the briefcase. They're fighting over it. Elias shows up and smashes his guitar over Corbin's back. This causes Corbin to lose his grip on the briefcase. Styles fumbles around with the brief briefcase. He loses his balance. It lands in Otis's hands. Otis wins the men money in the money in the bank match, and then celebrates. And, you know, does the instead of Rocky, Adrian, I did it. We have Mandy, Mandy, I did it. And so now, uh, the close of the show is Otis celebrating. So Oscar, I agree with winning the match. Otis. Uh, I mean, no, he would have been like my fourth choice out of six guys. Um, Because what it says is on the SmackDown brand that's on a network television, uh, mainstream network television network, uh, Otis, who is a cross between Eugene and the Bushwhackers and Tug Taylor and just all these mid-card characters is the best thing we've got because he should be challenging for a championship. It's an insult to the rest of the talent. I I want... mm. In all, this is a skippable show. I want two and a half hours of my life back. Um, But comment below, what did you think if you watched Money in the Bank and hopefully... You didn't, and you just listened to this review and saved yourself a couple hours to watch something good. I'm actually going to go cleanse my palate and watch some some uh, TNT or something. Anyway, hopefully this 35-minute uh, review is better than you wasting two and a half hours on this lackluster event. In any event, we will be back with more content tomorrow, Raw tomorrow, and other good stuff. 
Until then, keep your feet on the ground and your mind in the moment. Until next time, everybody. <laughs>